you to go to the book of Matthew. Chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And let's look at verses 5 through 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a certain centurion came. A centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and I tell that one come, and he comes, and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said unto the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. I want to talk to you from a simple subject called the word cure, the word cure. Father, we thank you for this particular moment. We thank you. We give you glory for today. We thank you for this word. Let it penetrate. Let it heal. Let it deliver. Let's save in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Somebody shout the word cure. The word. I was looking at the term cure, researching it, and Ashamedly, I had limited my understanding to that from a medicinal approach only. And as I continued down the trail of research, of course the obvious appeared to me that lifestyle changes are cures. Philosophical approaches towards life, they're cures. Environmental shifts can be cures. Dietary and exercise, changing of habits, can be cures. And so as I kept on being intrigued about it, I decided to call my doctor. I called my physician and I asked her, how do scientists phase out or process out cures? How do you come up with cures? With cures. And again, I was shaken at the return of the knowledge that she gave me. She said, and I quote, we do not use the word cure. She said, we are very reluctant to use the word cure because if you're not cured, of course, you could come back and sue us. She said, so what we do is we use the word removal or reversal, or the re it's in remission. She said, so we don't use that term cure, we say it's reversed, or it is in remission. So then I, I talked to her and I said, so then is it fair to say that since you don't cure, God does? And she said, of course. She said, all the medicine does, when we prescribe the medicine, we're facilitating the cure. She said, what we do is we give you the medicine to push back what's causing issues with your body because your body was designed to recover, to heal itself. So when God created you, God created you in mind that you can recover from anything. You cut yourself, your skin comes back. Somebody hurts you, you wake up the next morning, you can recover. Look at somebody and tell them you were built to recover. You were built to recover. So then I said, so, so it's fair to say that you don't heal, but God does. She says, of course, we, we prescribe the medicine to facilitate the cure, to help the body 
push back what's in the way to keep the body from recovering. So I kept listening to her and as I started thinking about how good God is and how he's Jehovah Rapha and he's the God that heals. And if you catch him all through scripture, he's healing all the time. And when you see him healing, he's healing blinded eyes. He's bringing people back from the dead. He's always creating all kinds of miracles. He's a God that heals. And so there is nothing that you can fall into that God does not have the power to heal you from. Look at somebody and say, my God is a healer. So then it is also fair to say that there are different types of cures or different types of healings. One would be medicinal healing, and then of course the other would be a divine healing. Uh, I'm not going to be against either one. If I'm here through the medicine, let me be healed. But if I can be healed divine, let me have it, because that means there is no evidence that nothing is still left in my body. This is the kind of God that we serve, that you can place your faith in him and he will remove the evidence that was in your body or in your mind or in any circumstance to try to keep you hindered from moving into the next level. Somebody shout hallelujah. So then I started reading and I continued the reading and as I looked in today's text, here's God, Jehovah Rapha, Jesus, who has entered into our text in Matthew and he has walked himself into, in front of a leper. And while this leper is standing there, the leper makes this claim. He says, if you're willing, will you heal me? But the response that Jesus gives is very interesting. Jesus doesn't say, I will. Jesus touches him first and then says, of course I will. This is interesting to me because he's already violated what the old covenant has in place. You're not supposed to touch a leper. But Jesus, who is the healer, lays his hands on him first to let him understand that there's nothing that you have that I'm not afraid to touch. This is the kind of God that we have, that when others would not touch you, he will walk right up in front of you. He will lay his hands on you and love you in front of everybody and violate every law that everybody says. Because by law, he's supposed to say, unclean, 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 to let everybody know what he has. But Jesus doesn't care what you have. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell him, he doesn't care what you have. He doesn't care what you have. Jesus walks up to the leper. He puts his hands on him and says, I will. He says, I will, I will. And then he tells him, now you go show yourself to the priests and let them know that you've been healed. Give the offering that Moses commanded and let them know that you've been healed. Something else has touched you. God has touched you. As he leaves this portion of the text, the Bible says he's walking into Capernaum. Capernaum is the home front of his ministry. Capernaum is on the northern shore of Galilee. It is a, it is a trading post. All commerce is there. So there's all kinds of different people that are there at this particular spot that he has made his home base for ministry. So while Jesus is on his way back home, the Bible says that there is this centurion he is the man over a hundred uh, soldiers. Uh, he has a decurion underneath him, and there's two more positions, a colonel, a governor, over the top of him. But yet he is the war horse of the soldiers. He's the one that's supposed to train them and get them prepared for war. He's a soldier in leadership. And so he's there doing what he does, but there's something interesting that's happening. He has a servant that he loves. It's translated that he's also his son, not his son biologically, but son as lad or a young boy in the Greek. So here he is, the son that is at his house. And the Bible says that he is paralyzed. He's paralyzed and he's suffering. He's tormented and he cannot move. This is what brought my attention to the text is because what I wanted to talk to you today as you go into this new year is to make sure that everything that has been paralyzed in your life, God has a word for it. I wish I had a witness here. God has a remedy for it. God has a cure for what has not moved, for what has been stuck, for what seems like it's lost function. It's lost the ability to be what it's always been, to do what it's always done. And 
in some kind of way, it's tormenting you. But in this text, I am so illuminated in my mind because the Bible says this man who is a Gentile, he is not a Jew, he is a Gentile, and he is concerned about his servant, but he doesn't go to the doctor of the Greeks or the doctor of the Romans. He decides, let me call Jesus. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them, call Jesus, call Jesus, call Jesus. So the first point I want to deal with is the connection to the need. Somebody shout the connection to the need, the connection to the need. So you've got this centurion who is a warrior who is not Jewish, who is Gentile. He's connected to who needs the help. This would be a threefold conundrum. You have the soldier, the savior, and you also have the servant. You've got the servant, the soldier, and the savior. All three are connected within the text. You've got to have somebody in your life that they can be connected to you and be connected to what you need. Have I got a witness in here right now? Because we don't hear in the text that the servant says anything. The servant never opens his mouth, but the soldier does. The soldier does the talking for the servant. The servant is paralyzed. The servant cannot talk. The servant needs the cure. We don't hear the servant praying a prayer. We don't hear the servant saying, Lord, I need you. We don't hear the servant saying, this little light of mine. We don't hear one word from the servant. The servant is suffering silently but yet the soldier who trains and who prepares people for battle has stepped into his role and decides I will go and talk to Jesus. Uh, Luke says that he does not go, but that he sends some of his Jewish friends. He sends his Jewish friends to have a conversation with Jesus because he doesn't feel like he should go. And the friends are telling Jesus that this man deserves for you to come to his house. Now watch this. He says he deserves for you to come to his house because he's built synagogues for us. He's built everything for us Jews, our synagogues. He's helped build our city and he loves us. So Jesus is hearing that and Jesus responds. Matthew does not mention what Luke does, but Matthew does tell us that he goes on his own. But while he's going to find him, he pauses, he pauses, and he says, I don't deserve for you to come to my house. That's a conundrum. That's a mystery because you cannot be a centurion without being worthy. You cannot be a centurion without being deserving. So then how is it that he is in a deserving place, but yet he does not feel like he deserves to have Jesus come into his house? This means that worthy or being deserving has nothing to do with your occupation. It has nothing to do with what you do for a living. It's all about a heart posture and where you are with God. If you know God and you understand God, then you understand it is by him saying, I will come. It is the will of God that brings him into our life. I wish I had a witness in here. He said, I would that none of you would perish, but all of you would have everlasting life connected to the need so when I start thinking about the connecting of the need I start thinking about this uh, 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 can I get two of our pastors my brothers Mike and then yeah yeah perfect, perfect 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 I start thinking about the connection of the need and the connection of the need is simply the picture of intercession so then if I have the problem and I also have the servant. Now you're gonna have to bow down because you're taller. Maybe I should switch y'all. Make you the problem. When you come occupied with the problem, and this is all you can deal with, your life focus is purely about dealing with this. This becomes torment to you because there's nothing you can do without shaking this. This becomes the lead. No matter what happens in life, you're stuck to it. it. It drives you, it pulls you into life. No matter how much money you make, it stays there. No matter who you marry, no matter how sexy you feel, it's always there. Because you have not dealt with it, it is a stronghold. And it will cause you to suffer. 
But the beauty about this is that God has a way of sending soldiers into your life. Wish I had a witness here. God has a way of sending a soldier. And when you start dealing with the picture of intercession, what the soldier does, and we have this issue with intercession, y'all want to intercede out here. I'll pray for you. I'll, I'm, whatever you need, let me do it for you. This is not intercession. Intercession is when you enter into the session. Yeah, see, I enter into the session. And what you can't do, I'll do it for you. So I begin to pray as you. Since Mike can't pray, I'll say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I break the hand of the enemy. Mike doesn't have the power to come out, but I got the power. I stand proxy for my brother, and I break the hands of the enemy, and I tell him to loose here and let him go, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It kind of sounds like what Jesus did. I wish I had a witness here, that he who knew no sin became sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. I wish I had a witness in here. It's the same thing that the Godhead does that when you don't know what to say, the Spirit of the Lord maketh intercession for the saints with moanings and groanings that cannot be understood. That's why you ought to say, Oh, hallelujah. I don't know what I'm saying, but the Holy Ghost does. I wish I had about 1,500 witnesses that would give God glory. To be connected to the need. To be connected to the need. The second thing I want to talk about we start looking at the connection to the need is the confidence in the word. You're going to have a word cure, you got to have connection to the need, and then you got to have confidence in the word. Somebody say confidence in the word. Take these down. Confidence is about trust and assurance, but it's also tied to your feelings. So part of the problem is you have to learn how to manage your feelings well because the first level of confidence is how you feel about it. And you have to learn how to move past what you feel because those things will sometimes play tricks on you. And so you've got to move beyond the feeling of confidence to the knowledge of knowing that God's got your back. But you've got to be connected to God to have confidence in His Word. And when you start getting confidence in your word, you understand, write all this down. Your confidence is the ingredient that makes your faith work, okay? Confidence is the force that launches your faith. And a lot of us love to speak his word, but we really don't have the confidence in it so that we don't believe that it will actually work for us. We'll quote it before we actually believe it. But the power is not in the quoting. The power is in the believing. And if you can just believe one word, you don't have to believe the whole Bible. If you can just get one word, you should have had a witness here. If you could come up with one scripture that you could hold into your arsenal, that one word for what will work for everything. I wish I had a witness in here. Somebody shout hallelujah. But there are often times that small pockets of doubt will create holes and vacuums in our faith and hinder the productivity of our confidence. Why? Because sometimes it's the cares of this world that are killing your confidence. When you look at 1 Peter 5 and 7, he says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And when you take a look at those three words, cast, care, and careth. Cast in the Greek means eperto, which means to throw upon. And then when you look at the word care, it means it's marimna in the Greek, and it also means the idea of distraction. And careth meno, which means it matters. You matter because God says you matter to him. So when you look at cast, God said, throw upon the idea of your distractions upon me. That's what he said. Throw the idea of your distractions upon me. Why? Because you matter to me. 
And so when you get so caught up with your distraction, your distraction becomes your God and you're not able to throw your God on God. You've got to take the idea of that distraction, take it and toss it and throw it to the God that says, you matter to me, you matter to me. I don't care where you are in your life, you matter to me. I didn't, it doesn't matter to me what you've gone through, what you've lost, what people have said about you, you matter to me. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, you matter to God. The cares of this world will choke your confidence. If you look at Matthew 13, 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. An example, I took my family to Orlando over the Christmas holidays. And I wanted to go kayaking at night. <laughs> I took them kayaking at night. And it probably wouldn't have been as bad if I hadn't taken them to see 2,600 alligators that morning. <laughs> so I took them to Gatorland that morning. And we was walking through 2,600 alligators. And I mean, they was eating up everything. And so the man made this statement that hindered my kayaking. <laughs> he said, while you're in Florida, if you go to any body of water, there's probably an alligator in there. <laughs> so we're out kayaking and our youngest daughter is 12 years old. I said, you come with me, we got in the water. I said, okay, now look, we got to be synced. So left, right, left, right. She said, okay, daddy. We're going pretty good. Some kind of way. <laughs> we got off pace and we start drifting. We're not drifting because she's not rowing. We're drifting because we're not on the same page. I got a little bit more on my right, she's got a little bit more on her left. And so we end up going into the marsh. Oh my God. We got to the marsh and she lost her mind. Oh, 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 daddy, come on, daddy, 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 back up, daddy, 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 back up, daddy, 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 back up. I said, Joel, calm down. She got the thing all up in there. Daddy, 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 get out of here, me. I said, I got mad. Now the truth is, she don't know, I was just as scared as she was. Because all I could see is one of them jokers coming up out of that yucka. I said, oh my God. But the cares, the distraction created panic. And when she started panicking, we couldn't get out of it. We were stuck no matter how much I rode, what she was doing was counter to to what I was trying to do. I was trying to get her to calm down and get us out at the same time. We can't lose our minds when we're in a circumstance that's trying to drive us crazy. It's already doing the job. You gotta stay focused and get your pace back. Ha, wish I had a witness here. You gotta stay locked in and come up out of that thing. I wish I had a witness here. Tell somebody you're about to come out right now. I got to do it. Let me tell you something. I had to take the paddle long ways, push it up against the bank and use power to get out of trouble. The paddle became my intercessor to back me up out of it. 
And once we got going, y'all be seated. Once we got going, she was all right. But that is what God is trying to communicate to you. That when you feel stuck in certain places of your life and things are in a paralysis mode and you can't get out and you don't have the function, you don't have the ability, you've got to stay calm. Even though hell may be all around you. You can't afford to turn into hell while hell is loosed around you. Tell somebody, stay calm, stay calm. See, you don't need the feeling of confidence. You need confidence. You need confidence. You don't need the feeling of the anointing. You need the anointing. You don't need the feeling of power. You need power. So that when things go crazy, you don't lose it. You rest in the fact that you know you're anointed. You rest in the truth that you know you got power. You rest in the truth that God is with you. So look at two or three people and tell them, I got power, I got power. I don't have to feel it to know that I have it. I don't have to, I don't have to hear you tell me I got it. I know that I know I got it. Even if don't nobody ever tell me I got it. Somebody shout, I got power. This microphone, this microphone is coming off my ear. Somebody shout hallelujah one more time. So we don't, we don't need the idea of confidence. We have to know that we actually have it. And so the Bible says in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And that if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. I want you to tell somebody that I know that he heard me. See, you pray different when you know that he hears you. You live different when you know that he hears you. You walk different when you know that he hears you. Because you're not guessing that he's with you. You know that you know that he's with you. And regardless of what you've gone through, you can ask for whatsoever you want. Because you know that he hears you. High five two or three people and tell them I know what I know. You can say what you know. But I know what I know. I have a God that's sticking close to me. I have a God that would walk with me. I have a God that knows me. I have a God that said, Lo, I'll be with you even until the end of time. Look at somebody and tell them I got confidence in him. Be seated. Once you understand that you got the connection to the need and the confidence in the word. It is noteworthy for you to understand the conception of authority. How did he know? How did he know? Well, Luke tells us that he heard about Jesus. Faith come by and hearing by. So he had heard enough about him and he had been intrigued enough about him to say, I want to know a little bit more about him. So he, in fact, begins to act on what he believes because you're not really believing until you start acting. <laughs> believing has very little to do with what you're saying. It has more to do with what you're doing. So when you know you believe, it changes how you approach him because of what you know. So he has this conception of authority. Conception means that it's how I form the idea. It's how I apprehend or the inception of authority. So here you have a man that is not a Christian. He's not a follower of the way. He's not even a Jew, but yet he is looking at Jesus's authority. It is his authority that allows him to identify with who God is and what God can do. This is why he says, you're a man 
in authority. But he describes himself as a man under authority. So he said, I'm under authority. I, it's, it doesn't rest with me. It rests with the imperial order. It rests with the main man. And everything that comes from the main man comes through this man. And everything that comes through this man goes to the next man. He says, so it doesn't matter who says it as long as it comes from the man. He says, so I don't have to have you come to my house because I understand the system of authority. He says, so I don't need you to lay hands on me, just speak the word. Because I had a witness. It is the system and the strategy of authority that makes him understand that I can trust what he says. Now, what I believe is interesting is, is that while Jesus is on earth, he has a little of authority. He has authority to forgive sin, which caused an issue. He has authority to, re to heal those that have been brokenhearted. He has authority over demons and over imps. And so these issues are all cures from a spiritual context. But here he is in this forgiving seat. He has not died yet. It is not until he dies and he comes back that he has all power, that all authority has been given to him from heaven in the earth. So he does not have all authority, but he is functioning in authority. And it is what this, uh, this centurion has seen that has intrigued him to say, let me go to Jesus. I'm going to be connected to the need. I'm also going to be confident in what he says, but my confidence is stemming from the fact that I understand how authority works. So then if that's the case, if you could grasp his authority, then you would understand that in the beginning was the word. Do you understand what I'm saying? The authority, that word was the foundation upon everything that everything was built. And so he says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. So that would simply mean that the word was before time. The word was before anything that you ever went into. So the word has a premise that sits on its own and the word is so powerful that it put on flesh and became a man. I wish I had a witness in here. So Jesus becomes the living epistle. He becomes the walking word in the earth. And it is something about the word when it comes walking down your street. It will change how you feel. It'll change what you say. It'll change the way you act. But you got to get a relationship with the word. Look at somebody and tell them you got to love on the word. You have to understand the authority of the word. That if Jesus said it, it's already done. If Jesus said it, it's already done. If Jesus wrote it and you can believe it, it's already done. Because you're living by the authority of the word. Look at somebody and tell them, have you got a word yet? Have you got a word yet? It is this conception of authority that he's understanding what Jesus can do. And so he's not limited to where Jesus is. Jesus does not have to come for him to get it. So what he proves to us is that he can work from a distance. Well, then you have to compare and contrast, Bishop, how Martha and Mary acted when Jesus didn't show up for them. Because for them, it was all about how come you didn't come? Which reminds most of us of how we act when people we know didn't come. So they got upset with Jesus. But when you read that Bible and you keep on reading it, Jesus never touched Lazarus. He still didn't touch him. All he did was stand in front of the tomb and say, roll the stone away. And the Bible said he spoke to him and said, Lazarus, come forth. See, Jesus still did it from a distance. But some of you got to understand, if you can get past him having to be here, that you've got the same God working in Dallas, that's working in California, that's working in... 
tell somebody he can do it from a distance. I want you to stretch your hand to somebody in the balcony. Somebody in the balcony, stretch your hand to somebody on the floor and tell them God can do it from a distance. God can do whatever you need to be done from a distance. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, Jesus, with the ability to forgive, whether he's there or whether he's on distance, he's providing cures. But the interesting thing about it, there can be no cure without a curse. There can be no antidote without the venom. Even the medicine has a part of the problem. The Bible says that cursed is he that hung on the tree. That he became a curse so that we could become free. So Jesus has taken the curse so you don't have to accept any curses that anybody says over your life. The man testified in the pre-show that his own mama was producing word curses in his life. He is living proof that a word curse cannot outlive the cure of the kingdom of God. There are people that are cursing you as you sit here right now. They cursed the day that you were born. They cursed when you got married. They cursed you when you watched a job. They cursed you when you got successful. But it does not matter what they say. What matters is what the word of God says. That you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're the lender and not the borrower. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. Tell somebody I got a word. curse is meant to hurt but a cure is meant to heal and when the centurion who is not a believer on paper who is not a Jew by birth but he heard yeah he heard Jesus was coming back home and since he heard him, he tried him. I come up in a time where they would sing a song, have you tried Jesus? And the congregation would say, he's all right. Then the mother would say, have you tried Jesus? And the church would say, he's all right. Look at somebody and tell them I tried him for myself. You got to say it like you got power, like you got more power than you ever had in your life. Look at somebody and tell them I got power because I tried him for myself. Oh, Lord. Have I got a witness here? Can I be Baptist for a minute? Somebody said that I tried the Lord for myself. They said I turned it over to the Lord and he will make it all right have I got a witness here grab a neighbor by the sanctified hand and tell that neighbor we gonna try Jesus we tried everything we've tried drugs and alcohol we've tried girls and boys but we are gonna try Jesus because Jesus will make a way out of no way put that organ in the monitor so I can hear it have I got a witness in here 
so the Bible tells us um, that the centurion um, begin to follow him um, and when he gets to Jesus uh, he tells Jesus don't come to my house uh, and Jesus said shall I come uh, but he says I'm not worthy for you to come uh, but if you would just speak the word uh, I believe everything's gonna be all right uh, what am I trying to tell you on this last Sunday uh, that God's sending a word to your house uh, have I got a witness uh, I know you want the word in this house but God told me to tell you by the time you get back home your answer will meet you at the door say yeah have I got a witness here come on and let's ride oh yeah have I got a praise here so the Bible says that you got to understand how he believed. But he told Jesus, just speak the word. And here's where the faith kicks in. He says, if you speak it, I believe that it's going to happen. See, it's not enough for you to just speak it. But you got to believe what you're speaking. Have I got a witness here? Shake one neighbor by the hand that's got an anointing and tell that neighbor, don't just speak it, but you gotta believe it. You gotta believe it while you're speaking it. You gotta believe it while you're praising it. You gotta believe it while you're praying. You gotta believe it. You gotta believe it. Have a gotta witness here. Grab one more neighbor and tell them, neighbor, I'm getting ready to believe God for a shake up in my house, for a shake up on my job, for a shake up in my career. For a shake up in my emotions, for a shake up in my relationship. Oh, yeah! Say yeah! yeah! Have I got a witness here? I believe that on this last Sunday, God told me to tell you He's got a word for your situation have I got a witness you got a problem God's got a word you got an issue God's got a word you got a dilemma God's got a word whatever you've been going through God 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 Go find three people and tell them God's got a word. God's got a word. I said find three of them. Tell them God's got a word. 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 If you believe God's got a word, open your mouth and say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to leave you here. But after you can conceive his authority, And you got confidence in the word. Yes. And you're connected to the needy. You got to have credence of the cure. All credence means is that you believe what he said. Tell somebody, I believe what the Lord said. Jesus said, God, I feel good in here tonight. Jesus told him, 
He said, go thy way. And it's going to happen when you get there. The way you believed. Stay up. Don't go down, organist. Have I got a witness here? So I asked the Bible, what way are you talking about? He said, when you go home, it's going to happen like you asked me. So I said, I got to tell him when I get to church in the morning. When you go home, it's going to happen like you asked him. But if you didn't ask him nothing, don't expect nothing. But have I got a witness in here today? Somebody said I'm asking him something. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to open your mouth and ask him for whatever you need, for whatever you want, for whatever you desire. Ask him what you will. Ask him what you want. Ask him what you desire. Open your mouth. Tell him what you want. Tell him what you need. Tell him what you desire. Tell him what you want. Tell him what's on your mind. Tell him what's been bothering you. Tell him what's been keeping you up. Tell him what's been racking your mind. Give him all your desires. Give him all of your secrets. Give him all your issues. Tell him. Tell him. Because he has a cure for it.